So, you know, Moab is great. There's a lot of tourist attractions. There's a lot of stuff to keep people busy. There's bike paths, hiking trails, climbing routes, all that kind of stuff. There's even a lot of cool things like dinosaur tracks, dinosaur bones. They're labeled. They got nice big signs and arrows pointing to them. But there's other ones that a lot of people don't find, a lot of tourists don't know about, and unless you really are able to kind of schnorr around and find them yourself, you might miss them completely. If you're watching the Rockorama, you're probably one of those people who wants to schnorr around and find some stuff on your own anyway. And if not, I'm here to help. That's what I do. We're going to go take a look at some dinosaur tracks and some other tracks and bone sites around Moab. I'm going to show you some things that 99% of the average people miss completely. It's not their fault. They're not labeled. Most people aren't specialists. Most people work making the signs, um, and most of the paleontologists that are on staff are not specialists in things like trace fossils. So they spot the dinosaur tracks, but they might miss the little things, little interesting things, little bug trails, worm trails, burrows, and stuff like that. You're in luck, because I'm going to take you around, show you some of the popular sites, but also show you some of the stuff that people have been missing. We're going to start off by looking at some famous tracks in the Navajo Formation up around the corner here on a big cliff, and plenty of people know about them, plenty of tourists see them, but there's a whole story to be told that most people don't get to see, and in fact, even the signs don't mention it. Keep watching, you're not going to want to miss this. Sand bodies that make up the channel bodies, fine grain stuff with the overbank, the floodplain in between. And then on top of that is the Navajo sandstone, the big Aeolian sands. We're going to take a look at it on this side of the road. It's right behind us. Bam, right there. There's the Kayanta below. Fluvial sand bodies, you can see they're kind of forming ledges. The Navajo up at the top. What's really cool though is back in the day, about 200 million years ago, we had dinosaurs, we had mammals, we had all sorts of you know insects and things that we have today hanging around the water holes. Maybe about as dry as it is here in Moab, as a matter of fact. It's a desert. It was a desert. So we're going to take a look out here and see what we see in these rocks. There are some pretty spectacular tracks, so get ready for them. This is pretty cool. As I'm walking, you can see the cross bedding in here. Uh, different than the Aeolian cross bedding that you see in the Navajo or the Wingate or the Entrada. It's lower angle. You see some little maybe ripples in it. These are typical bed forms of a fluvial deposit. So it's been suggested these are braided streams, might have been, probably were, um, but they were sandy nevertheless. So sandy little streams, not a lot of clay, not a lot of overbank material. Um, you certainly don't see any coals. So these are typical dry land environments. Well and truly a probably desert environment with fluvial systems moving through. So we're gonna take a look at some of the tracks. We're also gonna take a look at some tracks that a lot of people miss because they don't know about. But we'll show them to you. Here's a sign for the tourists. It tells you where the tracks are. They're nice and labeled. They warn you not to pour liquids in, presumably any kind of liquid, because it just helps erode the tracks, and that's no good. All right, so we're at the first set of tracks. There's a couple of them here. They're up above me in this block. Uh, if you're ambitious, you can climb up and take a look at them. We will in a second. Let me just show you what they're looking like. It's a couple of nice three-toed theropod tracks. There's some smaller ones up there. You can get a really good view of them. So let's climb up, take a look. I just want to see what they look like in place with my fancy new selfie stick. What an investment, best $9.99 I ever spent. You can see they're pretty good sized, about eight, 10 inches long. Now it's kind of a fun exercise. You can estimate how tall a dinosaur, a theropod dinosaur is by measuring the length of their foot, multiplying that by four to six, somewhere in there, let's say five. So if that's about a 10 inch track, the hip height on that animal would have been about 50 inches, about four feet tall. So, you know, it would have come about up to chest height at its hip, and its head would have come up, it probably would have been able to look me in the eye. So it's a pretty good sized beast. Not gigantic, it's not like an Allosaurus or anything. It's about like the Dilophosaurus in Jurassic Park, the one that eats Newman in the first one. Uh, as a matter of fact, Dilophosaurus is known from the Navajo Formation. So it's known from the overlying Aeolian deposits down in Arizona, but it's from time equivalent rocks to this. So this could have been a little juvenile Dilophosaurus. The adults got a lot bigger than the one that ate Newman, but everything's got to start small, right? Oh, are you seeing this? These are mud cracks. Look at these. These are actually casts of mud cracks that formed about 200 million years ago. So there was a big flood. The water got all 
um, deposited along with the sediment on the floodplain or in a river channel or in a bar top. As the water receded and that sediment kind of sat there and started to dewater and the arid dry climate took over, it started cracking it. You get these big mud cracks. The next flood comes in, dumps much sediment into those cracks, makes a perfect natural cast. That's what we're looking at here. These are casts of the mud cracks. Makes sense because the mud, the fine grain stuff is eroded. It's gone. It's not here anymore. What we're left with is the coarse grain sand. That's exactly how you make a track cast too of a dinosaur footprint or any footprint. Is a lot of times they're made of fine grain material. Gets squished in, hardens up nice. Next flood blasts a bunch of sand in, settles in. That sand solidifies. The fine grain material erodes, leaves behind a nice cast like this. These are pretty spectacular. These are awesome. I wish it was on a smaller rock and I wish I could throw it on my back and take it home because, wow, these are great. I'm just kidding. Don't steal stuff, especially from national parks. I don't think I'm in the national park room, but still, leave it for other people. Be a good citizen. This is just plain cool. Plenty of people over the years, centuries, millennia, have been really inspired by these rocks and the scenery. No idea what these guys were trying to say. Uh, maybe they were just loving nature, having parties, enjoying the bighorn sheep and snakes. And they are just having a good time. Makes sense. This is the kind of place to do it. I mean, man, it's hard not to be inspired to be artistic when you're out here. Look at this place. This is really, really cool. We are at the top of the Cayenta Formation, right where it meets the Navajo. So the Navajo, again, is that big cliff-forming Aeolian sand body. The Cayenta underlies it. And this place, the Cayenta, is a combination of kind of reduced silty sand and very red, deep red, deep purple, silt, maybe some clay. The best way to find out is to taste it. Let's do that. So if you really want to be a sedimentary geologist, or you just want to play one on YouTube. You have to learn how to differentiate clay from silt, from sand. The best way is with your teeth. So if you take a little fragment, in this case, I took some of that purple down there. I'm curious to see if it's clay or if it's silt. Take a little bit, nibble it. Hmm. There's a lot of clay and a little bit of silt. If there's silt, it'll be a little bit gritty on your teeth. If it's clay, as you start to chew it, it'll turn all creamy and soft and mushy. If it's sand, you'll know if it's sand. So it's really easy to get the grain size wrong unless you do your due diligence. Eat rocks. It's the only way to be sure. Your dentist will thank you. There's the Cayenta. There's the Navo. You just walk a little bit further. There's this big block behind me. You can already see in the light. There's some really nice tracks in it. There's a plaque over there that says that they're there. But if you're not here in the right light, you're not going to really see them. So let's climb up, take a look at it, see what else we see. I got a hunch there's probably going to be some really interesting little invertebrate traces as well as the big, sexy, obvious dinosaurs. Let's take a look. Lo and behold, on the very same surface with the dinosaur tracks, I started looking closely. Look what I see. There's little textured burrow fills. That might be something called spongiliomorpha or maybe steinicness. Um, there's also these little very faint, you can just start seeing it in the light, little striations indicating maybe an algal mat, a microbial mat. So this could indeed be a wet pond uh, with some standing water. Here's some more burrows. Look at this one, that's a nice one. Again, could be Steinicnus, could be Spongiliomorpha. Here's a big one. These are made by beetles, cicadas, um, crickets, all of which go back to the Jurassic. So we have fossils of all these guys. Um, this is pretty typical of a watering hole. It's just like you would see today, where there's the big animals go walking through, leaving their footprints. Nowadays, it might be a cow or a deer or a bear. Back then, it was a big theropod dinosaur. But in between that, there's the little beetles burrowing through. There's the crickets doing their thing. There's little worms and nematodes making things like these little squiggles. And there's a microbial mat that's formed, where the algae is kind of settling out in uh in the standing water but this is really cool seeing these little traces like that so we know there's invertebrates here we know there's the big vertebrates and we now know that yeah this texture this unique crinkly texture is pretty typical of of uh, microbial mats 
So this does look really like it was kind of a sort of in between the dunes. You might have had these little standing ponds. Makes sense. That's where the animals would congregate. Wow, look at that one. That is pretty cool. That's probably a nematode or some kind of worm type creature moving through. Um, you can almost picture it kind of doing its thing, wiggling through that kind of wet sediment interface. Here's another one over here uh, where the little guy was just kind of wiggling through. So again, kind of really supporting the case that we've got standing water wet enough that these little animals could really plow through, wiggle through, and leave a sinuous trail. Maybe as it dried up later, the insects came and made their little steinicness or, or whatever you want to call them, uh, spongiliomorpha. And of course the dinosaurs didn't care, they just came stomping through whenever they felt like, because they're big and bad and they can do that. This block tells a really, really interesting story if you know what you're looking at. It just occurred to me, you might be wondering, why am I saying that's a burrow? Uh, the material inside that little circle is the same as material outside, but if you look really closely, there's a discrete wall all the way around it. Very round. It's got a definite wall to it. That's not normal in something like a concretion, uh, which tends to blend in with the surroundings. Um, all of these things have those really discrete walls. And where they're exposed horizontally, you can even see some shape to them where they have these little, uh, you might call them pustules or um, sort of nodules. And that's where the invertebrate was moving along and piling sediment up as it went. Uh, we see that nowadays with spiders and crickets and cicadas and beetles do that. The most compelling case is something like this. Look at that. We actually see what we call meniscate infilling. So each of these little packets, they're kind of curved that way, that way, that way. Each of those little packets was piled up by the animal moving forward. It used its little legs to grab sediment, transfer it behind it and pile it in, then burrowed ahead a little bit more and packaged it up and sent it behind. So you get these menisci like that. And it used to be thought those only form in marine burrows, but as it turns out, insects do it. So beetles and cicadas do it. So this is pretty compelling evidence that this is a burrow fill that's now been exposed. Here's another one. As the light's hitting them, it's really getting good. You can see that wall surface. So we're looking at a depositional surface and all these little burrows are coming out in relief. Pretty diverse little invertebrate fauna in these ponds along with the big sexy dinosaurs. All right, here's a little bit different view from the other side. So you can see the big tridactyl track right there. There's a few of them down this way. Probably something like a Dilophosaurus. Again, that's what was found in the Navajo sandstone down to the south in Arizona. Doesn't mean it's the only thing that was running around making these tracks, but it's about the right size, got the right foot morphology. It's a pretty good bet that was it. There's some smaller ones down there. There's some medium sized ones in here, all different size you expect that right there's a fauna there's adults there's juveniles there's invertebrates okay proving once again why it's important to look all the way around a rock especially a block that's fallen down like this this is that slab with the big tracks on the front a little arthropod tracks a little insect burrows worm trails i came around the side just to see what i see this is the bottom and that's the top imagine this laying horizontally like that each one of these layers represents a single depositional cycle or event. You probably already noticed there's thick sand packages separated by very thin, darker grain material. Thick sand package, thin, darker grain, thick sand, thin, darker grain. It's a little bit lighter too, so there's something differential with the mineralogy in this stuff. There's a couple of environments you can do this in. One is tidal systems, where you get kind of high energy, low energy, high energy, low energy, deep spring, 28-day um, cyclicity of the astronomical tides. That's probably not what this is. The other environment you can do this in is a seasonal environment, strongly flashy environment, we'll call it, where you have a lot of runoff, standing water, and then that standing water, a little pond or whatever it is, develops algal mats. And the algal mats form those dark organic rich layers. They trap very fine grained sediment. The algae itself dies, leaves the organic matter. Aeolian dust and, and deposits get trapped in the tendrils, the filamentous tendrils of the microbial mats. Then you get another influx of sand, and then some more microbial mats, and then another influx of sand. So we're seeing possibly pretty good evidence of flashy discharge in the early Jurassic, strongly seasonal dry, wet cycles, dry, wet, dry, wet. It could be annual, it could be decadal, 
don't really know. But it's interesting and pretty consistent with the interpretation that this is a wet interdune environment, a lake shoreline or a little oasis with standing water more times than not. And then the sand comes in during a big rush of sand. It might be fluvial, it might be aeolian, we really don't know. We're right at that junction of Cayenta below is fluvial, Navajo is aeolian. This is from the Navajo, so it's probably a strongly aeolian component to the sand dumping into a little interdune pond. And coming around the front, lo and behold, that's the track face. The track face is in one of these darker microbial mat layers. That's a pretty cool story to be able to tell from a single block. So you put it all together and wow, we got an interesting tale to tell from these dinosaur tracks. More than just, oh, a dinosaur walked through and left some footprints. There's a whole ecosystem here with strong seasonality, wet and dry periods, flash floods, standing water, the drama of invertebrate life and death, big dinosaurs, little dinosaurs, a whole lot of stuff. Just from looking at some rocks, just from looking at the tracks, and just taking the time to kind of walk around and look and think. That's pretty cool. Talk about time traveling, huh? Not a bad afternoon, Moab. <laughs>